Now, when I set out planning this podcast right at the beginning, there was one topic that was top of my list and there was one person who I really hoped might be able to spare the time to come and discuss this topic with me. Now, the topic is menopause and joining me today to discuss her experience is TV and radio presenter, celebrity MasterChef champion, <laughs> um, my fellow This Morning family member, podcast host, so I'm hoping she can give me a few tips at the end, <laughs> and also a new author of your Yay! first book, Just Getting Started, Lessons in Life, Love and Menopause. Of course, it's the wonderful, gorgeous, Lisa Snowden. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you, Zoe. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you for having me. Honestly, so honoured to have you sat here with me. Now, we always start off this podcast by asking the same question. Uh Well, similar question. It varies slightly. So in your case, the question is, what is the one thing you should never say to somebody who is in the midst of their menopause? Okay, so I personally don't think it's one specific thing that you shouldn't say, um, because we're not like kind of these crazed animals who are just going to attack you at any, I mean we could but <laughs> usually um, I think it's about having more understanding and more empathy of somebody who is going through this at this time in their life because there's so many things they could be experiencing so you know if they haven't been sleeping if they're feeling really anxious you know some people experiencing menopausal symptoms or perimenopausal symptoms feel suicidal so mm. you know I would just have empathy and understanding and just be kind um because I kind of think that you know back in the day when people used to say oh she's got a period don't talk to her oh gosh she's gonna burst it's that kind of flippant you know really just unthoughtful um sort of attitude which I think needs to kind of go so I think it's it's not the one thing I just think it's about having some empathy and some understanding yeah good well that's what this podcast is all about because you know obviously I'm a medical professional and therefore I have a scientific understanding about a lot of healthcare conditions, but what I don't have is lived experience. And actually a lot of my healthcare colleagues, we don't have lived experience. So that's why it's called The Doctor Will Hear You Now, because Mm -hmm. this is really about somebody who has a lived experience sharing the details beyond the science, beyond the medicine of what it's like so that hopefully everybody who listens can be more understanding and just have a bit more kindness, a bit more empathy. So the topic today is menopause and I wanted to ask you, when was the first time you heard the word menopause or the word, or or actually when was the, well, when was the first time you heard the word menopause and when was the first time you heard the word perimenopause? So perimenopause is a word that I think is really new. It's Mm. new to me. It's new on my radar. So looking back, I think it must have been in my early 40s. Right. And I think it was Mariella Frostrop who did a documentary. And that was the first, first ever program um, I'd seen. And, and it was a real education for me. Um, she was talking about menopause. I don't know if she mentioned the word perimenopause. She must have. She must have. Mm. Um, so that was like obviously over 10 years ago. But it wasn't something that I thought would happen to me that soon because yeah. for me a menopausal woman was much much older um you know somebody who who was really frail somebody who might be sort of in their 60s and you know um so yeah so I think it was about 11 years ago but it was still seemed so far off in the future yeah. for me it wasn't like oh yeah because then two years later when I started experiencing what I now know to be perimenopausal symptoms I didn't realize that that's what was happening to me and do you know what, as you're saying that, I'm thinking I'm thinking about all the little leaflets in hospitals and GP surgeries that say menopause. Mm. And you're right, the image is yeah. of a, a, a lady who has white hair. Yeah. Um, She's you know, frail, she might need a walker. It's, yeah. it's totally not the woman that not. looks like me, you know. Yeah. I, do, I do colour my hair. <laughs> <laughs> Make no mistake about that. But I can, well, I'm fit and healthy pretty yeah, much, yeah, you know. Yeah. And I've got a really, you know, kind of lots of energy. And so it was a shock. And I definitely didn't put two and two together. And it's and the con- there's a contrast here as well. Because um, in your book, which we'll talk a bit more about later on. I'm really excited to talk to you about that. Um, but you shared in that book that actually, when it was at the other end, thinking about periods, thinking about your period starting, you wrote that your mum spoke to you about that when you were about eight years old yeah. and you knew about it. Yeah. You were sort of armed with all the knowledge and then your periods actually started later than most of your friends. So you kind of had all that knowledge and you were waiting. Yet with perimenopause, you didn't have the knowledge and it just came no. before 
yeah. you'd anticipated it. I mean, you don't get taught that at school, do no. you? Or you do get taught about puberty and, and periods and pregnancy. And yeah. then the perimenopause, menopause is just never mentioned. You're just sort of left to your own devices just to try and figure it all out. My mum never spoke about it. My nan never spoke about it. I didn't have any information from any of my older family members. So it was a complete surprise for me. I was totally uneducated and it's been you know, the last 10 years that I've had to find out for myself. Yeah. Um, not only experiencing it, but just trying to learn from doctors and professionals and from other women. Yeah, it's the, the, the fourth P I would say was, was left out yeah. in education. So you mentioned the three Ps there. Yeah. So puberty, periods, pregnancy, yeah. but perimenopause, you know, that needs to be taught to girls absolutely. when they're young. And boys. As well. And boys, yes, absolutely. Everybody needs to learn this in school. The boys definitely, definitely need to know. You know, their mums, their aunts, their sisters. You know, it's like, that's the thing as well. It's like, yes, it, aff it affects us women directly. I think it's 52% of the population. But indirectly, we've all got men that we know. Absolutely. People we work with. So everybody needs to know about it. It affects us all. Mm. And um, and we've both just written our first books. Yes. Um, my book's very different to yours. Mine's for, it's, it's designed for girls aged 9 to 13. And I've made sure I have put that fourth P right. in there. The four Ps. Because this, the sooner people know about it, the better absolutely um, congratulations by the way thank but you but there's a theme it's all hormones it's like it's basically you know those little devils that right really must well now you up. said that there was a little snippet there was a little <laughs> something in your book i was going to read out yeah. because i read it and i just thought that is so true on so many levels so you wrote hormones weirdly are never considered by anyone even professionals to be the issue when we're struggling they're never at, ever at the top of the list of potential contributing factors to our state of body or mind our hormones are clever and like to trick us with their lack of consistency and rebellious attitude <laughs> i just thought do you know what that is so true yet they evade us as professionals and as people when we're going through something, yeah. often they're the last thing we think about. And actually, yeah, so, so I've had so many conversations with, you know, think, thinking about periods throughout our lives. We've been having periods for many, many decades. Yet even myself as a doctor and my scientific knowledge and having lived with periods for decades, I'll be ratty and irritable and in a bad mood and, you know. Craving chocolate, want to kill everybody. Yeah, you know, like <laughs> my emotions are all over the place, yeah. like just bursting into tears yeah. at watching an episode of, I don't know, something like, I don't know, like The Apprentice. Um, and then the next day I get my period and I'm like, ah, oh. it's like, but again, why, why are we not, you know, I don't make that connection until the next day when my period comes. Yeah. It's like, why do our hormones evade us? I know. Why do we not think about them? Well, you see, I, I started to become much more in tune with my body um, because I was so up and down. Like I was so, I was literally probably only about three or four days where I felt normal in a month. Yeah. You right. know, because you've got all these, like the rise and fall of everything. Yeah. Um, and so it, it's, I started to become really interested and I was like, I feel like, I feel like absolute crap. I don't fit into my clothes. My boobs are hurting. I'm swollen. I'm sore. You know, then I'm angry. Then I'm emotional. Then I'm hungry. Can't stop eating. And it was just this like a crazy roller coaster for the whole month. And then I'd finally get my period and I'd be like, ah. Oh. <sighs> I can breathe again. Yeah. Um, so well, I. Then you know you've got the that period where it's a little bit easier, where your yeah. hormones are more favourable yeah, to exactly. feeling the way and you, you want to feel. You just have to deal with maybe some pain or some yeah. heavy bleeding or. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it's been a struggle. It has been a real struggle my whole life, and um, and then the perimenopause came, and it was horrific. So tell us then, tell us, tell, talk me through your experience of the perimenopause and then the menopause. Yeah, so um, I was 42 and I I started to feel um, really low, like low, low moods, like dark moods. Um, I started to have anxiety. Um, I'd cry a lot. I just felt like I couldn't cope anymore. I felt like I couldn't process changes Mm. any kind of stress um and I just felt I just I just felt so lost and I didn't recognize who I was so I went to the doctor and I think you know I've spoken to loads of women now I know that this is a really common thing because we get to the doctor surgery we're so grateful to be sitting in front of the doctor we know we've got such a short window of time and you can't really express how you're feeling you just burst into tears you're just yeah. like and then this is happening and that and I understand the first port of call the doctor's like oh my god you're clearly on the edge you're really down you know ha have you had a breakup have you had a bereavement and it's all these sort of uh, and it's quick and so my first um 
the, the, the first doc, doc, doctor I went to see put me on antidepressants and I get that and there is a place for them but I just had a feeling that that wasn't what I needed mm-hmm. I just knew that that it, I, there was something else going on um, so I did take the prescription and I got the anti- antidepressants and I took them um, but I wasn't happy taking them mm-hmm. and I don't know why I felt like it was a bit of a cop out from the doctor and I felt disappointed and I just felt that I knew that there was something else going on it wasn't just my mind it was like the disconnect between my body and my mind as well I took them for a while and I went on holiday with George I just got back with my partner George who I mean, I'm now engaged to um, he's in the book a lot which is very exciting it's really exciting Lovely, George. and so I in theory should have been really good spirits yeah. you know new relationship super happy anyway we went on holiday our, our second holiday together and I had forgotten to pack my pills my um, antidepressants yeah and so I sort of had three left and we we're on like a 10 day trip and so I had to slightly wean myself off of them which I know isn't ideal and if you are given that prescription you have to wean yourself off properly and speak to your doctor but I just had to wing it because I couldn't yeah. get them yeah. so I did like half and then a quarter and then just sort of tried to st- stop them and you I did basically, the best that you couldn't I under the, the circumstances I could, so I yeah. stopped them and then um I didn't really feel any different. Um, and the thing is with perimenopause, it starts kind of morphing into other things. So then the sort of the mood changed and then I started, my cycles started going all over the place. Right. So I'd go from a 28 day to a 23, to a 15, to an eight day, to and an it, every it three day. And quite regular. And it would always been like clockwork. Mm. And then I started bleeding so heavily, mm. like hemorrhaging blood where I couldn't leave the house. Like if I was sitting here now with you talking, I'd be so paranoid I was gonna bleed through. Yeah. Um, and I did occasionally on buses and restaurants and it was just mortifying. And then along with that pain um, that used to come with the periods, there was um, like a, a like nauseous feeling, like really sick, where I just curled up in bed and I just didn't want to leave the house. Um, and then the anxiety came back. And this was kind of over a few years here and there and it kind of changes and it comes into something else. And then I started getting hot flushes and then I started getting night sweats and... And then the anxiety comes back and then you're sort of lying in bed at night and you're just about to fall asleep. This is one of the worst side effects, I'd say, um, because you're going to sleep. And you know sometimes when you feel like you're falling and you wake yourself up, it was similar to that. But it was like somebody had grabbed hold of my heart and was crushing it. So I now know that it's like a sort of adrenaline surge. Yeah. Um, And so that would happen. And I'd be terrified to go to sleep because I thought I was going to die. Like it was literally terrifying and I couldn't really explain it yeah. um and so yeah I went to a couple of other doctors um I started going to see uh, this acupuncturist this lovely facial acupuncturist and she would look at my tongue how Chinese doctors do um and she'd always say you're really hormonal you're getting your period and literally the next day I would bleed like she was kind of witchy and yeah. brilliant um and as soon as she put the needles in me I just felt like it was a balloon being popped and the air would just Right. I was just so tense and I put on weight, I put on about yeah. three stones. So all these things started happening and it wasn't overnight and it kept changing. Um, so it was like a moving target. It was really hard to lock down what was happening. Um, and so it wasn't until I saw Sarah, who's the acupuncturist, that I could that she said, I think you're perimenopausal. Right. And I think that was probably the first time I remember remembering that word yeah. and relating it to me. And so I went to a couple of doctors and I spent... So how old were you then? So I was about 44. Right, okay. So it was two years after I first experienced the sort of sadness and the dark moods and the emotional kind of... And the rages. Oh my God, I got angry. I forgot to tell you about that. Poor George. Poor George. I mean, there's there's a bit at the end of your book. It's a dialogue, <laughs> yeah. an actual dialogue you had with him. And yeah. I I mean, I, I, was, I was actually sobbing like proper tears reading that he's so lovely we all need a george he's amazing honestly he's been my <laughs> but i want to hear about the rock. rages but yeah i used to just we'd be having a great time mm. have a couple of glasses of wine coming from a date and all of a sudden bang i just switch for out of nowhere it was almost like i was like dual personality i just turn into another person and i would just see red and i just want to scream and shout and cause chaos and just ruin everything and then you left with this guilt and you just feel awful because mm. you're just like oh my god I'm, you know he's gonna leave me and I, I, what's wrong with me I'm you know so you've just got all this sort of these mind games that you're kind of playing with yourself um and you're just trying to work out why you don't recognize yourself anymore so at that time when that's happening 
and um, you know, it's, it's threatening your relationship or mm. you, you perceive actually when you read the dialogue from George, it was never threatening the relationship, yeah. bless him. But, but that's your perception and it's awful and the guilt. Did you know it was your hormones causing it at that stage? I or still didn't you know. still didn't really I know. still didn't really know. Mm. It wasn't, it, I mean, looking back, I think he did. Because when yeah. you read that dialogue, he's, yeah. he's almost so much wiser um, and he knew it was... It was well, he, he says he knew it was that wasn't really you. Yeah. It was a behaviour. It wasn't yeah. you. This is a good they're, one. They're good guys. They're really good guys. But it's taken us bloody long enough. Let's it's be honest. taken us it's long taken enough. Us long enough. Um, but, but he came at a time when I was like, oh my god, he's being tested to the limit. Yeah. You know, the last eight years has been so rocky, and he's just been there by my side. I mean, thankfully, we knew each other years ago. Yeah. But um, I still think even if we hadn't, he'd still just he would have stuck by me and yeah. just held me on those nights when I just sobbed and sobbed and you know was championing me when I felt like I couldn't say yes to work because that that's the thing your confidence goes with perimenopause yeah. like you don't trust yourself you're the brain fog the sleep deprivation you wake up the next day or if, if you're lucky enough to have slept and you're just like who the hell am I how am I supposed to go and do a presentation how am I supposed to get on public transport how am I going to get dressed yeah you know your clothes don't fit you your face starts changing everything about you is just like you're like I don't I don't know who I am anymore so you know those days when I just sit on my dressing room floor and like piles of clothes around me I'm like I'm supposed to go out and nothing fits me I'm supposed to go and host an event and nothing fits me how am I going to stand up on stage I don't even know what my name is let alone like yeah. I'm doing a podcast today. It's with Doctor yeah. Doctor. Who is it? Yeah, yeah. I know you. You're my friend. Yeah. It's like you know. It would just be you start not relying on your own brain to be there for you, and then your body's letting you down because you're pouring with sweat, and then mm. your head bleeding, and then you're bigger than you want to be, and it's just all these things that's such a a shock um, and really hard to get your head around. So kind of on that on that timeline then, 42 when you first went to the yep. GP yep. and were given an antidepressants yep. for what, you know, looking back. It was the serotonin uptake thing is. The selective serotonin yes. reuptake yep. inhibitors. Yep. So <laughs> things like yes, 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 fluoxidine, yes. sertraline, telegram, things like that. Um, so that was age 42. Yep. Age 44, you saw this Chinese Yeah, so my Chinese doctor. doctor she, who she, mentioned she perimenopause. She mentioned perimenopause. She recommended a doctor. <sighs> It just wasn't a good experience. Mm. So I went back and then he said to me, yeah, it's as I thought, you're definitely perimenopausal. So that means you're getting old and you, you can't have kids. And I just sat there and I literally dug my nails into my hands and I was just like, I had the biggest lump in my throat. And I was like, I was, I'm not gonna cry in front of this man. I don't know him. He's got the worst bedside manner. Like how insensitive is that? You deal with women, you're a fucking hormone doctor. Yeah. You know what I mean? How insensitive? And I was like, yep, yeah, okay, I got it. And I was like, obviously I walked out of there feeling completely empty because yeah. up until that point, in my head, I still didn't think I was premenopausal. I'm still digging my hands in, yeah. uh, digging my nails in. Um, I still didn't think I could be premenopausal. And I thought I'm, I would trick the system. I'll still be able to have a baby. It's fine. I look quite good. Surely my inside's still behaving. Yeah. Um, but then when he told me that, I was it was like a kick in the guts. And you know, I'd already had some fertility. Um, it, you know, I'd, I'd gone to check my um, egg quality and things like that a couple of years before, um, and I had been pregnant and I'd miscarried like literally a year before 18 months before so I just still thought no he's absolutely mad I can definitely mm. still get pregnant so obviously I had to have that conversation with George and just say look it's looking really unlikely um but anyway he gave me there's two different camps there's body identical and bioidentical hormones and he gave me bioidentical hormones which turns out was a cream mm. he didn't once mention estrogen which I now know is what you need yes. when you're a perimenopausal woman. Yeah. Um, and so I, he just gave me progesterone cream to put on through my skin and nothing really changed, to be honest. Um, I think perhaps in the first couple of weeks, I think placebo in my head, I started to think, yeah, I feel a bit better. Yeah. But then nothing really did change. How old are we now? We are 46. Right. Um, this is four years in. Yeah. And I'm, four years is a long time. It's a long time. And and by this point, um, I was three stone heavier. I was not sleeping. I would go to bed and the sheets would be, I'd literally, George would come in for a snuggle and I would just be like, oh, 
it's like get off me just the heat that just used to engulf me and then the furnace was the it the furnace, furnace he called you he called me fernie but it just fernie. i didn't know how to spell fernie so i just put the furnace in the book but he used to be like fernie's back oh. and it would just be like whoosh of yeah. heat and then the bed sheets would be soaking wet mm. then i'd have to get towels put them down and then you start shivering cold because the bed's mm. soaking wet then you get hot then you get cold then you're peeing all through the night for some reason i don't know where the liquid was coming from but i'd kept peeing every yeah. hour on the hour and so then I'd wake up and, and then I'd have that adrenaline surge mm. if I did manage to fall asleep. And then the next day I just would be like, I just can't do this. And that went on for about a year. Now I'm 51. Yeah. I am post menopause. So this is, I'll be in October. It'll be three years without a period. Right. So that's yeah. definitely post menopause. So the menopause is when it one year passes yes. from your last period. You've had a You've full had... year without having any bleeding. Yeah. So mm-hmm. it's two and a half years since I've had a period. So in lockdown, it, this was obviously in 2020. So that's three years ago. Um, yeah, I was, I was, I was, I'd been running a little bit and sort of taking care of myself and doing a bit more exercise. Um, and so I'd lost a little bit of weight, but not much. But I was very unhappy and the night sweats were terrible and the anxiety was terrible and obviously you couldn't do anything in lockdown you couldn't go and see anybody but then I managed to um, link up with Dr Potter Dr Naomi Potter on Instagram Instagram's so good it's yeah, such a good platform really for is. some uh, you especially know especially during lockdown oh my you know. gosh you know, you've done so many things on there to help other people as well haven't you <laughs> so is this 2020 then you this meet Dr Naomi Potter at the Potter end of 2020 in October end, and you start finally and taking, start the, correct taking the correct HRT what? which I now know to be the correct HRT I'm um, so yeah, this is October and I think I started to feel better probably about a month in. Right. Yeah, and it, it's a juggling act because again, it's a moving target. You have to go slowly. You have to start slowly and manage your expectations. But the reason I wrote this book is because I wanted to explain to people that it's not a silver bullet. It's yeah. not like you're going to take it and then all of a sudden life's fantastic. You might not get your libido back. Mm-hmm. That's just something. I'm still looking for mine. <laughs> uh, and I'm on testosterone. Um, it's just, you know, you, you change, you change as a person, but yeah. you can do a lot to help yourself. So, you know, managing your stress, doing your breath work, your mindfulness, doing your movement, eating well. From speaking about it on my social, I know that, that having that sense of community and sharing what's happening to you can just be a game changer, like a lifesaver even, because you realize you're not alone. Yeah. You know, you're not weird. It's just what's happening. Yeah. You know, it's the the, the more well-known symptoms and more the more common symptoms, but also the lesser known symptoms of the perimenopause and menopause. And I just want women to realize what's happening to them so they can get a handle on making these lifestyle tweaks and then also being able to go to their doctor and getting the right diagnosis and the right if they want their HRT. Um, So that's why it was just so important for me to write this book and be really honest, even though I'm terrified for my dad to read it and my mum to read it because of some of the stuff in there. anyone who's listening, (laughs) if you want a really honest, open account of everything that (laughs) happened to Lisa, it's all in there, Um, no holds barred. Um, I wanted to talk, so I mentioned before that we're, we're well we're a similar ish age there's a few age few years difference in age a little bit <laughs> you're being kind um, <laughs> well I guess I'm 43 now so I'm the age now yeah. when you were going through yeah. all of this and and I thought I'm a doctor but I find it because I'm surrounded by it I'm a little bit terrified but I think one thing that I did want to talk to you about we met our partners at a similar time you know we both met our partners later in life we were both I uh, before I met Stuart um I really always wanted to be a mum and I know you felt the same way and um, and I froze my eggs a few years ago and um, and I think, you know, I feel so grateful, so fortunate that when I met Stuart, you know, within three dates we'd had the conversation and within six months we were, we were trying to get pregnant and we're so, so lucky that we've got little Lisbon and you are always so lovely like oh, throughout my gorgeous. pregnancy he's gorgeous, like ever since he's been here you're always how is he you're so <laughs> you're you're a proper girls girls and and you really care but I must admit there's a little bit of me that always just feel because I know what it was like when I was in my late 30s I was 40 when I got pregnant um and people around me were having all my friends who were younger than me were having their second baby and married and third baby and I'd always feel so happy for them but just a little bit of resentment a little Mm. bit of I don't even think it was jealousy I think what I felt was um it just felt a bit unfair Mm. and so that was always at the back of my mind because I knew we sort of met our partners at a similar time Mm. that you you've always been so kind and so lovely and I know it's genuine 
but I've always just felt a little bit a bit bad because I know you want you did want to say I did want children absolutely so, I always wanted kids and I've never asked you about it no I know and now I'm doing it on a podcast when lots of people are going to listen is that okay to ask it's totally about okay it? yeah absolutely absolutely and thank you you really sensitively put that question and I can tell that you're getting emotional so I feel emotional you. asking about not to, it but, um, no and it is you know it, it has been a big deal it has been a like a, um a process definitely yeah. um to get to this point where you know you have to you have to do some work on, on on trying to be really grateful for what you do have in your life um and I think you know up until this time until I you know in the book there's stuff that I've never mentioned you know that's happened to me and I think you know I got a lot of um just judgment from people you know for not having children and a lot of people just assumed that it was a decision and I chose my career and all this kind of stuff yeah. but you know it's never that simple there's no. so many different variables that can happen um and in actual fact I just kind of run out of time and I I don't know how it life has gone so quickly but it has mm. um and I have been pregnant and you know it, it, I I do I know what you mean about the sort of the not jealousy or envy but that sort of that pang of something in your gut when a friend says I'm pregnant and you're like so happy for them but yeah. at the same time it's slightly tarnished with a with a sadness that yeah. you just think oh and then I still kept thinking that I might still get pregnant but you know once I got that um that first perimenopause diagnosis I I said to George look if you want to think about having kids we're going to need to do something like you know will I need to have an egg donor or you know because I'd already gone to look at freezing my eggs um I was just I just over 40 so I was maybe like 40 in six months and you know the doctor was like I just think he, he did all the tests on my F F F S F um, a M A M H was it? Oh, Anti malarian hormone. Oh, I, to, yeah, yeah, egg quality. That's A M H. So he'd see. He looked at that and he said, you know, look, it's really low percentage. Once you, you know, defrost the the eggs, you know, it would be better with an embryo. And I didn't have a partner, so that was never a thing. And then yeah. I got pregnant naturally, literally, right. like about six months later. So I was always thinking, like, it'd be fine, it'd be fine. I'll cheat the system. Mm. Somehow I'll get through this. So I said to George, if you do want to have a baby, we need to think about this. And he just put my mind at ease, and he just looked at me and said, I'm just so happy that we're together. Like, if it's just you and me, then that's all I need. And immediately, it just took that pressure off yeah. because I felt like I was letting him down yeah, as well as myself, yeah, yeah. you know? It's yeah. like when you love somebody, it feels like the, nat not for everybody, but it feels like the next natural step is to, you know, have a baby together. So it, it was a bit of a process. And, and I'm not going to lie, even once we'd come to that decision, I still thought maybe this month I'll get pregnant. And I did still think that for probably till about 2016 yeah I still kept thinking yeah it's gonna happen yeah. um and then I sort of gave myself a big hard reality check and was like you need to let this go now mm. um but the lucky thing for me is that I do have I'm really close to my sisters and they've got we've got you know on my sister's side there's three little nieces and nephews yeah. who I couldn't love anymore if they were my own I swear you are the best God, best auntie them. in the world and then my brother-in-law George's brother and I well, know we're not technically married um there's two little girls there as well so okay. I've got like five kids all under 11 yeah so I get that I get yeah. uh, FaceTiming and we're chatting all the time and I get all of that goodness and then I can give them back and then I can have lions and I can and go, on holidays, go on holidays and holiday to adult yeah. only resorts <laughs> On so cruises, I can go and see you, my get to go, you get to stay in bed on a Saturday morning, exactly. drinking coffee, drinking coffee, watching documentaries, which I'm sure a lot of mums and dads to you're probably just very good parents and you've got your children under control. Um, mm, not no. you, not yet, not yet. <laughs> you can't make your breakfast yet. You're still a little bit young, but he'll be, he'll be air frying your dinner soon. Um, but, but um, yeah, so it was, uh, it's. Yeah, and some days I've, I've definitely put it to bed. That's not to say I still do get little pangs of like, when I see George with my nieces and nephews, he's yeah. so good with yeah. them and he's so clever and gorgeous. That I just think, oh, I'd love to see him. With like, I know that if we were to have a son, if we would have had a son together, we'd have such a little geek, like a proper little train spot, <laughs> like a little mini George with a briefcase. It would be just oh. so cute. I've got to that point of acceptance and gratitude and I am really, I love my life. I love George and I just feel like it was all meant to be and I do really think I'm a work in progress and that 
I perhaps wasn't meant to be a mum in I wasn't meant to be a mum in this life. Maybe and in this life. Yeah, and that's kind of where I've got, got to. What I'd like to do for the last little bit of this yeah. is I'm 43. Yes. Had a baby a couple of years ago. And I sometimes, every day, as somebody who is a doctor and who talks about menopause a lot in the media and otherwise, I am very, very aware that perimenopause is on the horizon. Yep. Um, so I probably overly think my hormones, like everything that happens, I'm like, oh, this is obviously perimenopause. Um, but I'm absolutely terrified. Don't be terrified, please don't um, be. And I think I'm not the only one. Um, it feels really scary. And, you know, hearing what you went through, it was, it was horrendous. So I think... The next question to you is, what can people who are going through it, who are in it, or people like me who are, it's, it's, you know, it's the big thing to happen next. How can we, how can we have the perfect perimenopause or the perfect menopause? Perfect menopause. <laughs> what can we, what can we do? What are your tips uh, and tricks and take homes yeah. and advice to one, prepare for it and to, you know, get through it as seamlessly as possible and I, and I think knowing what you know now yeah. I guess thinking what you would say to you would have said to yourself back then I think it does first of all don't be scared mm. don't be scared because we're so much more informed these days we're so much more educated um to recognize what's happening to us that you won't have to struggle alone or in silence or to feel like you're losing your mind because but I don't want you to be like, oh, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, because then you're just wasting your life and you're not living in the moment. Yeah. So just read up about it mm -hmm. and, you know, speak to your friends, speak to your loved ones as and when you're starting to feel differently, things are changing, you know, have those conversations, like don't bottle things up. Um, you know, speak to your friends, because if you've got friends of similar age or even younger or older, like we're all have a very unique perimenopause journey and at different ages as well. It can happen younger, it can happen older. Um, so I'd say don't be afraid to talk about it. Don't be afraid about it at all because, you know, once you know what's happening, you can then start to make changes. So, you know, if you are having anxiety, that's one of the first symptoms that comes up. Try and manage those stressful situations. Try and eliminate coffee. Try and eliminate people that, that stress you out. Um, you know, try and do more breath work in the morning, like just even five, 10 minutes just to get you into a good place. If you're going into an environment or into an interview or on a journey, God forbid, driving sometimes freaks you out now, you know, mm -hmm. like, oh, it freaks me out. Mm -hmm. um, just so that you're in a good space, give yourself plenty of time. Don't rush, look after your nutrition. Notice if things, food, alcohol, sugar starts to trigger you. Keep a food diary if your body starts becoming um, triggered by certain foods or bloating um, because that can happen too because your hormones do play a big part in your gut health as you know um, so yeah keep a food diary just keep an eye on what's going on and just try and manage your stress just try and slow things down don't say yes to everything don't multitask like us women we <laughs> do everything and we think we're good at it but is it good for us it's not good for us so just slow everything down and just take this time for you and be kind to yourself and be patient with yourself and start learning to kind of love the changes and and and, and the way that we're aging because you know, I'm massively pro-aging. It's like, you can't stop time. You can just try and accept what's happening and learn to love the little imperfections that start coming up. Um, but I think community, talking about it and being kind is it are the most um, the most vital things. But, you know, also just trying to be in tune with your body. You know, we know mm. when some, we eat in something and we go, oh God, that didn't agree with me. Yeah. Or if you have too many drinks and then you start getting anxiety or angry or you're up all night, palpitations because you've had like two margaritas and <laughs> like it's gone to your head um yeah just be aware of what's happening you, you talk a lot about acceptance yeah, as well yeah and it's you know it's I guess it goes back to what we know we can't change the things we can't change it's a lot of its acceptance and yeah and doing what you can to to live the best way through it yeah. um, I'm going to read out something else that you shared in your books this is quite early on in your book and I just love this so okay. this comes from um Chinese culture yeah. and how they view menopause and aging very differently to how we do. Um, so in Chinese medicine, they believe that during menopause, the energy needed for our uterus to grow a baby becomes free to travel to the heart, generating a renewal, a rebirth, a deeper wisdom, a time for a spiritual reconnection with oneself. Mm -hmm. In other words, the menopause is time for you. Yeah. And I think that's exactly what you've spoken about, haven't you? All those things that you've just spoke about that can help support you in this time, it's mindfulness 
meditation, doing things for you, winding down, yeah. stepping out of that, I must be everything and do everything and be everywhere for everyone and actually showing up and being there yeah. You've got for to put yourself. yourself at the top of that list. And it's not selfish because if you're not up there, you can't give to everybody around you. You can't mm. give to Lisbon. You can't be that. You know, you have to put yourself first and you know what I also love about Chinese medicine they call it the second spring it's the second spring it's like your time it's a time of empowerment it's a time of reflection to look back at what you've done where you've been what you've accomplished be proud of yourself and do the things that you've that maybe you've been too scared to do and that's why the book's called just getting started because I believe that I am just getting started I've got this new sense of self-love and um and empowerment and I'm not the same person I was 25 years ago thank god <laughs> but now I like who I am and I think I want women to feel the same way about themselves and just have that attitude that they are just getting side they're grabbing life by the balls and they're doing exactly what they want to do I, I mean I can't think of a better place to bring in our expert now to have yes. a chat with us let's bring in Sam because that is just a real positive high Yay. note to end that section on thank you so much Lisa So we're now joined by Dr. Sam Wild. Thanks for joining us, Sam. And it'd be great to kick off by hearing a little bit both about your professional and personal experience when it comes to menopause. Okay, so um, I've been a GP for over 20 years now. Um, at medical school, I think I had the same experience that most of us had, that we didn't learn much about the menopause. I can't really remember being taught about it at all. Uh, GP training probably received a little bit of information about it. Um, and then it was my own experience really um, about 13 years ago now when I went through the menopause myself. I had a hysterectomy for endometriosis and was plunged straight into a surgical menopause and really struggled then with, with the management of it. And, and so it's my own lived experience that made me want to research more about it and find out about it. And, and going through that then really sort of gave me that passion to ensure that other women didn't have the same experience that I had. Um, I joined Bupa eight years ago, um, then realised that we were seeing a lot of women at our health assessments that, again, were struggling with the menopause. They weren't getting the right information. They didn't know what treatment they should have. And I spoke to my colleagues at Bupa and, and we talked about how we could help women. Brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. It's uh, really refreshing, I think, to have a professional and expert, but also to have that lived experience. Absolutely. And so you were plunged into a surgical menopause. You didn't get HRT or, or advised... I was given HRT, but a very old type of HRT that we don't use so much these days. Uh, we do find a lot of gynaecologists still prescribe it, but it wasn't one that particularly suits a lot of women. Yeah. So um, I had quite a lot of side effects from it. And, and so over the years, I had to try a lot of different treatments before I found the one that really suited yeah. me now. Because I hear this so much about just women not getting that aftercare. Yeah, and exactly. that They just like the, the symptoms and the side effects and the suffering they have to go through once they've had a... Um, you know going through a surgical menopause is just hideous yeah. Yeah. and even now I mean you know I have to fight with my GP every year they're like you've been on HRT for more than five years and I'm like yes <sighs> and I'm still under the age of 51 and I need to stay on it until then at least but I'm actually going to stay on it forever anyway because why would I come off it yeah. uh, and I still have that fight each year mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I shouldn't I'm going to mm -hmm. take it to the grave if I can <laughs> <laughs> not coming off it anytime soon well I mean what you both said just flag up a question that I'm going to come on to, which is about, you know, the way we talk about menopause now in the media and the huge benefits of educating and empowering women to go to their GP and get HRT because it is the gold standard treatment for perimenopause and menopausal symptoms. But the question I'm going to come on to in a moment um, is, are there any dangers in perhaps have sometimes those conversations for some people gone too far? Are there any dangers that could come from that. I'll come on to it in a minute. Okay. Before we do. Okay. Lisa's looking at me <laughs> no, like she's gonna kill me. But but Sam, um, first of all, I just wanted to pick up with you. You've obviously listened to the conversation that Lisa and I just had. And was there anything that that came anything that you wanted to comment on? Correct. Yeah, correct me. <laughs> um, elaborate on and I think also actually Lisa wanted to clarify a couple of things with you but first yeah, of all yeah, yeah anything you wanted well, to well just to say thank you Lisa so much for sharing your story I mean it makes such a huge difference doesn't it yeah for women to hear people like yourself sharing your lived experience so that they can learn from it and get that help that they need so yeah thank you, thank you. and I can't wait to read the book Yay. um <laughs> And um, well, I think really interesting what, what Lisa said, just to put it sort of into perspective, that one in um, a thousand women under the age of 30 will go through the menopause, one in a hundred under 40, 
one in 20 is between the ages of 40 and 45. So, you know, it wasn't that uncommon, yeah. you, were, you know, that age. So, you know, again, as you said before, this is not just a disease of old women. Mm. We've got to remember that this could be happening to anybody amongst us, you mm. know, in our, in our personal lives, in our work lives as well. And, and as um, you've rightly highlighted, you know, even younger women, because of surgery, exactly. because of treatments yeah. for cancer, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, just, just to highlight on that, um, I think interesting as well what you were saying about uh, you know finding the right treatment. Um, Bioidentical hormones are, are not good. Um, they have been around for a long time now, but they are unregulated. They don't have that evidence base behind them. We don't know how they interact with other things. We don't know if they're even being absorbed. Um, and a lot of ladies will say that they want to, to have those because they're being marketed as a more natural approach. Well, most of the modern HRT that we use these days is body identical HRT. It is natural. It, it comes from yams, which is a root vegetable. So the estradiol that we use, the eutrogestin that we use, it's as natural as it's going to get, and it mimics our own natural hormones. So I always reassure women in that way as well. Over the age of 45, um, nice guidance. So the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence, which is the guidance that we follow in this country, tells us that you don't need to have a blood test. If you've got all those other symptoms of the menopause, you don't need that FSH blood yeah. test at all. Mm -hmm. um, under the age of 45, yes, if you're considering it as part of other diagnoses. Um, but again, if there's enough symptoms there, then we, we can treat without that blood test being raised. Because as we were just saying, you know, it fluctuates so much, um, not just day to day, but second by second. Really? So, you know, you can take a blood test one minute and it's up there and the next minute it's down there. So you, we can't use that for diagnosis. We have to go on symptoms as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But having said that... Um, I know this is something that's come up for me a few times actually in clinical practice as a GP. Um, we can't just automatically assume it is, even if a woman is having a set of symptoms that could well be menopause, it is to some extent still a diagnosis of exclusion, isn't yeah, it? And we you have know, to there be are lots careful. of things we need to rule out yeah, and not yeah. miss, yeah. such as thyroid disorders, you know, diabetes. Exactly. There are so many things it's that can have similar. If they're having the adrenal thing, it could be yeah. younger, it could be. Totally. And because, totally. because menopause, as, as you've rightly said, Lisa, can literally give well it can just about give any symptom yeah. um yeah. from top of our heads to the tips of our toes um so it can overlap with so many other so so i guess to people you know if you go in to see your gp absolutely please do tell us i think this is menopause yeah. say yeah. those words yeah. i think this is menopause yeah. i think this is perimenopause let us know that's so helpful for yeah. us yeah. but your gp might still want to do some tests to rule out other things exactly. and that's the right thing for them yeah. to do and they might yeah. do an fsh they should do if you're under the age of 45 but they may do one if you're over Even that that's age confusing sometimes because then they say oh you're within range and it's like well it means nothing yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. So and it means nothing thing. so that's so if we get an fsh which is above 30 yeah that's diagnostic of menopause, that's useful. But if it's below 30, it doesn't mean it's not menopause or pro-menopause, mm. it's, it's, it's less useful. I would write a list of like, like you said, write a list, go in there and be like, this is what's happening. Don't leave anything out. Could it got, be? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Could vertigo, it be tinnitus, all these yeah. Yeah. different things yeah. that you, you know, that you think, oh, I had a bit of a dizzy spell. Write it down and take that list so that yeah. you can get your point across yeah. Um, yeah. in that short time you've got. Yeah. With, yeah. with your GP. And I think often for some women as well, a three month trial of HRT is not going to do them any harm. So sometimes yes. we will try that too. Yeah. You know, whilst investigating for other conditions, could this be something else and doing those other blood tests, but actually having a trial of HRT is not gonna do any harm. And that, that's sometimes uh, the best way of identifying if it is menopause, isn't yeah. it? Well, we'll try three months of HRT if it makes a difference that would indicate that it is menopause. If it doesn't make any difference, that would indicate that it's less likely. Oh, that needs yeah. to go back to the drawing board yeah. and start again. Yeah. Lisa, did you want to clarify anything with yeah. Sam? <laughs> the estrogen dominance, I just don't know how to explain yeah. that. Why did they say that I didn't need estrogen? Why were my bloods coming back as looking like I was estrogen dominant? Yeah, I don't know. So we wouldn't normally check your estrogen levels. That's not something that we routinely need to do. If you're going through the perimenopause or the menopause, the symptoms that you're getting suggest that your estrogen levels are low and therefore you need topping up with yeah. estrogen. So we give estrogen and that's what helps with our symptoms. The progesterone we give, actually, we only need to give to women that have uteruses yeah. that haven't had a hysterectomy to protect the lining of the womb from too much estrogen and overstimulation of it. Um, and so the progesterone in itself isn't normally a treatment. Now, eutrogestion is brilliant because it does have a sedative effect to it. So for women that are having problems sleeping, it can help with that too but it's actually the estrogen that is you know helping with most of our symptoms yeah, so you know with conventional medicine we don't really recognize this estrogen dominance yeah. we know you need estrogen thank you i think that's helpful because i often get asked by patients can you check my estrogen levels can you and 
and, and we we, yeah. we can't yeah. really it's not yeah. within our guidance to do so no. and that's why because yeah. it doesn't there actually change some the outcome circumstances the treatment. when we might be checking them if we were considering starting testosterone if someone is on a, a maximum dose of estrogen and they're still getting a lot of symptoms just to see if they're absorbing it yeah. properly but it's yeah. not something that routinely needs to be done it's certain cases only mm-hmm. sam lisa kind of set out um you know some she gave some really good tips and advice and there's loads more in the book about how people can approach life this this part of this window of life perimenopause and menopause a lot of it around um self-care and and self-importance i think and self-love do you agree with with that approach or can you add anything what are your thoughts (laughs) absolutely agree (laughs) absolutely so before i even talk to my ladies about having hrt we talk about lifestyle yeah it is so important to look after yourself and and as you said lisa you've got to make yourself the priority and you shouldn't feel guilty for doing that so you need to eat well you need to have a healthy balanced diet um we all know that we can gain weight unfortunately going through the menopause and and our body i always say to, to my patients about you know middle-aged spread unfortunately does exist it's our body's way of sort of laying down estrogen it lays down fat in a way to mimic estrogen so Mm. it does happen the bingo wings come in as well we start to lose some of our muscle mass so so important to eat well get a lot of protein in your diet and exercise too and exercise helps us maintain our bone mass which we start to lose after the uh, menopause Um, makes us you know stay nice and strong we had that mindfulness element with it too it helps us maintain our flexibility our mobility and also obviously we'll have hopefully have some benefit with some weight loss as well but even if it doesn't you know I say to women there's so many other benefits you're getting from your exercise don't give up just because you're not losing weight and you want to Um, so really really important keep alcohol to a minimum as well as you said you know apart from affecting our mood it can really affect our sleep quality it can set off a lot of those menopausal symptoms as well, hot flushes being one of them. Um, So, you know, don't smoke, obviously. Our risk of heart disease increases after the menopause. So more than ever, we need to look after ourselves at this time of life. Um, So, you know, all those things that we all sort of, I think in a way, because we hear it so often, we almost negate them, Mm -hmm. but it's so important at this time of life to be really looking after ourselves. Yeah, and I think having just had this genuinely, my thoughts, having had the conversation with you just now, Lisa, as someone who, you know, I know for me, this is the big next chapter in my life that's coming, is thinking, why wait until it happens? You know, I'm going to start thinking about instigating some of these changes now in preparation for, and just to say, I think a lot of the things Sam said there, um, you have some brilliant experts who've contributed to your book, who've done the little sections, haven't you? Tim Spector, who I love, talking about intermittent fasting, Megan Rossi on gut health. Um, I can't remember the name of your, Dr. Neon Potter on menopause. I can't remember the name of your exercise expert, but- Paul Paul Webb, he's uh, fantastic. Yeah, talks about the benefits of- He's he's great about resistance training and really building our muscle mass to increase our bone density and increase our metabolisms and all the things that we need to do um and also you get that feel good happy hormones don't yeah. you the serotonin buzz and endorphins. Well, so you never you regret know. an exercise never. session do you you dread never, it ever, but ever. you never you regret it, it afterwards like, oh, ever i'm so proud of yeah. myself but yeah, yeah and then there's rhiannon lambert who's a nutritionist oh, yes. and um Lovely and dr rhiannon. charlotte gooding who gives us some good sexy time advice there we go yes, yes. um <laughs> so yeah final question then i'm going to bring us back to what i was saying about you know we are talking about menopause more than ever in the media as doctors you know as gps now we can't get away from menopause training, which is a wonderful thing. There's probably something in my inbox once a month, which is an opportunity to do an online training course for menopause. So there's no excuse really now, I think for GPs to to not be up to date. The new NICE guidance is very, very clear um, and very succinct actually. So there's no excuses. Um, But are there any dangers or any downsides to the, the surge in media awareness and I'm with you Lisa you know Davina McCall and all those band of amazing women who've been out there banging the drum um Sam in your clinical experience are you seeing any any pitfalls in that I think going back to what we said before about making sure that we are considering other illnesses and we're not putting everything down to menopause so again you know absolutely brilliant that women are coming in with that awareness of it but we've just got to be careful that we're not passing everything off to that Mm -hmm. um the other thing is sometimes um, it's expected that once you've got the HRT, it's almost like the magic bullet mm. and that's going to solve all. And I do say to women, it's going to reduce most of your symptoms, but it's not going to make life perfect. Yeah. Unfortunately, nothing is. And again, that's where that lifestyle comes back in as well. You've got to do everything else you can to help yourself 
in conjunction with taking the HRT. It's not as simple as taking, you know, well, taking the eutrogestion tablet, using the gel, whatever. You've got to be looking after yourself too. Yeah. Um, obviously, we've got problems at the moment as well, just with getting enough HRT in yeah. the country as well. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, that just needs to be sorted, and, and it's brilliant that we are running out. But again, that, that's been the main issue that I've seen from all the increased awareness is that brilliant women are getting the treatment that they should have, but we just can't keep up with, with the. And, yeah. then, and then you run into issues as well because well, then people you're swapping and changing treatments yeah. and people are yeah. not doing so well on what they were before. They can't get doctor's appointments. So again, that, that's creating an, another issue. So that yeah. really needs to be solved as quickly as possible. Yeah. Yeah. And just to say, that's kind of me being devil's advocate there. You know, I think we're all singing from the same song sheet that HRT is the gold standard treatment, but it's not the magic Absolutely. bullet. Mm-hmm. Um, Manage your expectations a little bit. And yes, sure it's not necessarily going to fix everything Make those changes overnight. Still, I mean, I still get anxiety. I still, you know, there's certain things I still need yeah. to do as a matter of self-care and routine in yeah. order to really look after myself. Yeah. yeah, and we have to remember there are some people who, who can't take it, yeah, who absolutely. can't take it safely, or who try it and it doesn't work mm-hmm. for them, they have mm-hmm. side effects. Cognitive behavioural therapy, which yes. you mentioned before as well, amazing. is amazing. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, it really helps, not just with some of those mental health issues that you may yeah. get, but we know it can also reduce hot flushes and night sweats, it improves your sleep as well. So, you know, I, I always encourage my women to access that as well if they can. So I think, I think the bottom line then, we can all agree, is this is an inevitable part of life yep. for all of us women. Yep. Um, and I think, you know, having this chat with both of you, I feel so much more educated, even as a doctor, you know, I've got the scientific knowledge, but I feel more educated, I feel more empowered, I feel more ready and I feel more positive, I think, about the next chapter of my life. So I want to say a massive thank you to you, Lisa, a massive thank you to you, Sam. Um, And I'm honoured to share my sofa situation with you today. Thanks so much. (laughs) Thank Thank you. you.